my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and you certainly are our redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. St. Augustine opens his book, Confessions, declaring to God, You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until it rests in you. Earlier this year, I spent my evening quiet time with laying my eyes across the writings of St. Augustine. And at first I thought I might be wasting my time. And, and after all, what does a 4th century saint from Africa possibly know about a sinner living in the 21st century in the United States of America? And then there it was in Book 1, Chapter 1 of Confessions, the most famous and often quoted line from St. Augustine, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until it rests in you. Theologian James Smith argues that we live in a restless culture. And I suspect that Smith will not receive much pushback from us in this beautiful and sacred place. Our culture is forever looking for something, for someone. We long for something else. The country band Sugarland at one point sings, there's got to be something more, got to be more than this. Our culture spins its wheels, never seeming to gain traction. And if we watch any TikTok videos that are trending today, it will show a culture that is starved for meaning and authenticity. As St. Augustine, one of the doctors of the early church, might diagnose that our culture's symptoms as those that belong to a restless heart. But the moment we start pointing our collective finger at the culture around us, we would be wise to hear Jesus whisper into our ears, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. We too, upon further examination, are guilty of distracting, or, or distracting ourselves from the hungers and the haunting absences in our lives. The flashing billboards and the loud television commercials seductively promise the very things we are looking for. Happiness, satisfaction, and joy. And yet, like fish, we keep biting the same hook. We are perpetual consumers of advertisers' promises that never deliver with any staying power. And in our human condition, we know too well of the restless hearts of which St. Augustine wrote. This morning, our restless hearts unite with the restless hearts in John 6. We are all in search of bread that will satisfy our hunger. Earlier in John 6, as we heard last week from Pastor Doug, Jesus fed a crowd of 5,000 with only five barley loaves and two fish. And then John, in his understated way, tells us that the large crowd was satisfied and that Jesus commanded them to gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. Ironically, they collected 12 baskets of bread, only to lose sight of Jesus, the self-proclaimed bread of life. And maybe it was good to, to good effect that John shouts through the ages, letting us know that the crowds have found him again. The crowd, once they find Jesus, want answers, Rabbi, when did you come here? 
And perhaps their demand of Jesus ought to make us wonder what they are really seeking. This well-placed question opens the door for Jesus' discourse that follows. And I've never noticed when Jesus is asked the question, he almost never gives a direct answer. It's like he's mimicking the rabbinic tradition, and that's how they got to, de they'd ask more questions. And, 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 and it was the way that they allowed themselves to go deeper in their conversation. Jesus knows why the crowd seeks him, saying to them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. In the fourth gospel, the feeding of the multitude serves as a road sign along the interstate. And he writes, says of the signs that they are designed to lead the eye and the mind and the heart beyond the miracle to Jesus, the sent one of God. Legend has it that the famed Swiss theologian Karl Barth was riding in a streetcar in his home city. And he took a seat next to a tourist and the two men started chatting with one another. Are you new to the city, Barth inquired? Yes, said the tourist. Is there anything you would particularly like to see in the city, asked Bart. Yes, said the tourist. I would like to meet the famed Swiss theologian Karl Bart, was the reply. Do you know him? asked the tourist. And Bart answered, as a matter of fact, I do know him. I give him a shave every morning. The tourist got off the streetcar at the next stop, quite delighted with himself. He went back to his hotel and he told everyone, I met Karl Bart's barber today. How many times have our restless hearts failed to recognize Jesus the way the tourist did with Karl Bart? How often do we settle for a sign pointing towards a feeding, but never sup with the Lord at his table? When have we mistaken the miracle and missed the miracle worker? Jesus stands before us with the imperative, do not work for the food that perishes. And if we are honest, we might wonder, are Jesus' words too late? Hasn't the streetcar already left? Are we too far gone? Have we missed our chance? As Americans, we are deeply invested in an economy that banks on the food that perishes. The treasures we store come from exotic places like Home Depot and Walmart and Kohl's and Amazon. We work our lives away in a restless pursuit of things that slip through our fingers. For bread that goes stale and grows moldy if not eaten in time. And if eaten in time, it's just a matter of more time before we search for our next quick fix to kill the growling of our stomachs. And like the impoverished farmer named William in Nicaragua, we know the world has to be changed. The other day I began to push back against John Buchanan's advice to trust your hunger. I created a short list of why we shouldn't trust our hunger. Leading the list was relativism. But I am wrong. Maybe it is this restlessness in our hearts that we need to listen to. Maybe it's this longing in our souls we should examine. Maybe it is our hunger that we should trust. 
Because it points to a deeper spiritual hunger, one that is only and ultimately satisfied in Jesus. Jennifer Benjamin Brooks reminds us that in every sermon there ought to be good news. <clears throat> and the good news is that Jesus is imperative. Do not work for food that perishes includes an emphatic but. And we know how a but moves in a sentence. Whenever you see the word but, it cancels out what went before it and signals that something important is about to be said. I won the lottery, but I lost my ticket. I made it to the airport, but I missed my flight. I caught a big fish, but it got away. And let me borrow something from your hymnal. Help me if you know it. I was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Jesus says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. And our restless hearts raised the same question as the crowd that day. What must we do to perform the works of God? And at one level, the works of God are the miraculous deeds that Jesus performs in the gospel. And at a deeper level, the works of God are the whole mission uh, in the world, of Jesus' mission in the world, ultimately his death on the cross. Jesus answered, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who, who he has sent. And immediately the hands go up. Well, what are the signs you're going to give us then? So that we may see and believe you. What work are you performing? Recently, N.T. Wright released a, a book entitled Broken Signposts. How Christianity Makes Sense of the World. And right points to seven signposts, justice and love, spirituality, beauty, freedom, truth, and power. And we hear of these broken signposts in our everyday vocabulary. You know, I used to think that murder mysteries were, were all about the blood and the gore, but maybe it's a sign that our culture is hungry to know that justice still matters. You know, I used to cringe at the commercialization of Valentine's Day, but maybe it is a sign that our culture is hungry to know that each person matters. I used to walk by pieces of art and roll my eyes at the price tag. But maybe the works of art are a sign that our culture is hungry for beauty. Every injustice, every act of violence, every form of hideousness is the place where the work of God must begin to happen. And the work of God demands our unconditional commitment to Christ. The work of God means that we must align our values with heaven's ethics, striving to make life here on earth as it is in heaven. The work God calls us is in our allegiance to Christ to fix the broken signposts of our world, all the while pointing to Jesus, the bread of life, who can and does fill and sustain the hungry. The work of God involves the confession on our lips, acknowledging what St. Augustine said in the 4th century to be true among us today, that our hearts are restless until they find the rest in God. I offered this to you this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.